Hello, and thank you for participating in our online annual discipline specific activity. For those of you that I've not met, I'm Kaylee Malsey, the Associate Dean of School Partnerships here at Penn Highlands Community College. While I have communicated with all of you in some form or another, it is my pleasure to work with each one of you. As many of you know, we typically hold an in-person event each fall, allowing you to work face-to-face -face with the college faculty and our college faculty liaisons to talk about many topics, including course content, delivery methods, assessment, or research and development in the field. This event is a requirement of our NACEP accreditation. While it saddens us that this year we were unable to hold an in-person event due to the COVID-19 pandemic, our liaisons have worked hard to provide an opportunity for us to still meet the requirements in some face-to-face -face format. In the fall, faculty liaisons held live Zoom meetings with ACE faculty. We understand that not everybody was able to attend these meetings at the specific time, but the meetings were all recorded and have been uploaded for you to complete and view at your leisure. Supporting documents from all of these meetings are also included on the training pages. We appreciate your time in completing the annual discipline specific activity. There is a short survey that we are asking you to complete once you have completed the training. If you have any questions regarding this training or other requirements, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. You can email me at kmalsey at penhighlands.edu or give me a call at 814-262-3859. Thank you again for your dedication to the students and your participation in the ACE program. Thank you. All right, so um, for those of you watching this video in recording, my name is Sam Fuge. I am your faculty ACE liaison <clears throat> um, at Penn Highlands. Um, I teach at Penn Highlands, I teach Music 100, Music 200, um, as well as some other classes like Life 111, um, and very soon some psychology and counseling classes. Um, my undergraduate degree is in music education, and I am uh, one semester away from graduating with a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. Big switch there um, from teaching to counseling, but um, I'm still going to be teaching music at Penn Highlands and acting as the faculty liaison for uh, the ACE program. So as part of the professional development um, night tonight, um, I'm going to talk about something that I use in my classrooms called the Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning or POGIL for, shirt, for short, excuse me, P-O-G-I-L. Um, <clears throat> a POGIL is something that I discovered um, by accident, actually as a student. Um, I was taking some classes, um, some prerequisite classes, and um, one of the classes I took, it was a chemistry class. Um, the teacher taught everything with the POGIL method, and I absolutely loved it and decided to... Um, essentially redo my entire curriculum um, for teaching into Pogel, which is really nice because it's something that, as you will see, takes a lot of the <clears throat> responsibility of learning the material and taking the material and um, applying it to students. It takes a lot of that responsibility away. Um, there's some upfront work, but then after that, <clears throat> you can really work with students to kind of discover um, this new material for them. So it's definitely a, a, an interesting method, something that is, um, goes against traditional foundations of teaching, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the quote that I have that kind of like summarizes all this is that the art of teaching is the art of assisting discovery. And truly, that's what POGO is. Um, so when we look at um, traditional approaches of teaching, they are usually teacher, lecture, student, listen. Um, death by PowerPoint or homework hell. Um, <clears throat> but that idea that we have all this knowledge and we have to give it to them and that we have to present it and that we have to, um, you know, put it out there so that, that they can just like soak it up and eat it up. Um, and so a lot of us, um, I, I say a lot of us, I myself um, was at the point where, especially with my Penn Highlands classes, I had all this knowledge and I wanted them to get it. And we had 15 weeks and we had to do it. Um, and so PowerPoint kind of became my default. 
um, and you as well, you know as well as I do that even though we're using PowerPoint here, um, the PowerPoint can be pretty boring, get pretty old, and it doesn't really engage any active learning. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, this year, everything because of COVID, everything we are doing this online, so I kind of have to. Uh, I kind of have to do this PowerPoint um, as much as I would like to do a POGO activity with you, um, but it is something that we can adapt to a classroom that is online through Zoom. So we will talk a little bit about that as well. But if we were in person, we would be definitely doing this rather than talking about it. So from the POGO standpoint, um, the teacher is first and foremost a facilitator. We are taking the focus, the spotlight off of us and putting it directly onto the students. Um, and they are responsible for their learning. They learn as a team. <clears throat> they work together um, on projects that we will see. And they start to, um, with a little ember of material, if you will, they start to light that fire and build that fire so that it can, um, they can discover all aspects of whatever material we're trying to teach through discovery. We also focus on the process of this. And that essentially means focusing on how individuals are working in the group. So even though we're learning music or chemistry or whatever you're using this for, the students are also learning about themselves. They're learning about roles in teams and how to facilitate certain roles. They're learning about limitations and they're learning about cooperation in groups. So it's a bigger overarching picture um, above the material that's being taught. And there are inevitably every year students that hate teamwork. They hate group work. They'd rather just work alone. They'd rather get worksheets and do them. And I think for a lot of students, that's comforting because it's something they're used to. Um, they don't have to rely on other people because that's sometimes uncomfortable. And they may have some social um, anxieties. So with these roles that we assign them, and we'll talk a little bit more about those here shortly, with the roles that they're assigned, they have a small little uh, framework in which they are allowed to operate. And that kind of helps them to know that they have a role in the group, know what their role is, and know that others will respect that role. Um, and this is also something that if you're looking for participation grades, um, I know at Penn Highlands for the Music 100 level, um, part of their grade is attendance and participation. <clears throat> now, philosophically teaching or th speaking, I'm not a huge fan of getting a grade for attendance. Um, however, I did not design the syllabus um, that was designed by other people. But uh, for as far as participation and attendance grade goes, I use their process um, grades toward their participation. So in order to get that participation grade, they have to be present, i.e. attendance. Um, and that grade is based on how they work in their groups. This is super easily adaptable to any classroom. Um, and like I said, there's some upfront work, uh, but essentially once that's done, your, your responsibility as far as your investment of time into this outside the classroom is done. Um, we just had a textbook switch from the, uh, I believe it was a third edition to the fourth edition um, and to the essential listening guide. And so, or essential listening edition, excuse me, that switch, there were some little things here and there, some new examples of songs and music in the text that I had to go back through and, and clean up a little bit. There were some chapters that were um, compressed together. Um, and I believe there's one or two new chapters in the book that I had to create some material for. But again, that's minor tweaking of the overall collection of Pogo lessons for this particular class. This is really a change in philosophy. This is not just changing how your classroom is laid out physically or changing um, how you're grading or how you're looking at things. This is really a change in your orientation of teaching. It's that, again, shifting of the spotlight from teacher to student. Student is discovering material. The teacher is there to facilitate this discovery. But why? <laughs> And I think that at some point in our lives, we all meet change and we all meet resistance with change. Students are going to be a little uncomfortable with this change, especially when they're coming from another class that is lecture-based, um, very teacher-oriented. 
And now we're bringing them into a classroom where it's all group oriented. Um, this change may be uncomfortable. As they experience it though, and as they work through it, uh, usually about a quarter of the way into the, the semester, um, my students are very comfortable with it. They look forward to it. They look forward to their roles and they know coming in, this is different. So it takes them out of that. I got to sit through another class and I just, oh, I got to listen to this guy ramble on for 20 minutes. Um, it takes them out of that, which is very nice. Um, and so when we teach um, by telling, this idea, this lecture-based idea really is not sufficient. Only about 30% of the material that you're actually talking about is received and even a lesser percentage, I think it's 14 in most of the research, uh, only about 14% of what you're actually saying to them is received and understood and comprehended. So that's a huge amount of material that's just wasted. Um, and so when we start to incorporate them and make them interactive in this process and the learning process and engagement where they are responsible for their learning, we start to really get them more, um, more involved in their material <clears throat> and more interactive with, with each other. This creates a more personal ownership of that knowledge and um, helps the student to really connect um, more deeply with that knowledge, especially whenever there are questions <clears throat> and the activities that may uh, relate to personal issues in their life or something where they can connect personally a situation that happened um, with what is being taught in class. So when we look at POGO activities, we can use them to introduce new concepts. So maybe you're just not comfortable enough yet to move away from entire lecture based, but there's a concept that's coming out that maybe you want them to um, understand a little bit more deeply. To, get, to provide an example, um, if you're teaching music 100 um, and you go by chronologic order, um, obviously, new concepts can be the new uh, musical eras that we're going through, like the Romantic period, Classical period, things like that. Or <clears throat> one thing I like about this new edition um, is kind of what I have been doing the last couple of years in my personal class, but um, on page T02, um, which starts right after part seven, um, in this, era, in this uh, part of the book, it gives you thematic overviews. So um, the first one, for instance, is music and sacred spaces. If that's a new concept you're looking at, that's something that um, a pogo activity may be used to introduce if you're then going to lecture more about it later. Um, you can use it to fully replace a lecture. Maybe there's a concept that's really difficult for students to understand um, and you want them to take a little bit more closer look at it rather than just kind of sitting and listening to it and kind of hoping it soaks in. Um, and if students have misconceptions or you know that they may have misconceptions about a certain topic, um, this is really exciting when students uh, especially think they already know something about what you're talking about, or um, maybe they truly do know what you're talking about. And this gives them a chance to kind of help their team members to learn. Um, or they find out, wow, I really didn't understand that. Or wow, there really was a lot I was missing. So it kind of helps them to figure that out for themselves. In the POGO groups, <clears throat> um, each team, I, I have my teams set up about four people, maximum five people per group. Um, but there are different roles for each student. There's a facilitator, reader, recorder, or presenter, which can be split into different roles if you have more uh, roles that are needed, a reflector, um, a technician, and an encourager. Um, and even though these sound, you know, encourager kind of sounds a little bit maybe dumb. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is something that, again, when we go back to the process guided part of this, we are looking at what we are adding to a team, what we are adding to a group of people. And it's the job of the encourager to say, hey, that's a really good idea, or thank you for looking that up. That was a really good addition to our group. And even though it seems so slight, we all know that positive reinforcement goes a long way, um, especially if you have students that are coming from classes like a math class or a science class that's super difficult. They're not getting it. They're feeling pretty poor about themselves. 
And now somebody in that group is telling them, hey, good job with this. Um, as little and minuscule as it seems, um, that is probably one of the most important roles of these groups that I've seen just as far as attitude in the group goes. Um, technician, um, I often uh, don't have this role in my groups because from a music standpoint, there's no um, use of a calculator. Um, early on when we go through parts of or elements of music at the beginning of the book, um, they're each given a keyboard. So that person operates a keyboard. Um, but really the recorder is the one that's writing stuff down and operating in a computer if I have them do it on the computer. Um, these roles also change a little bit when we're talking about in Zoom. Um, when we have a group completing things in Zoom, um, they can fulfill a lot of these same roles, except there's one person that is the recorder, one person that's reading, um, and all these other roles are kind of still present just in their own separate homes. Um, like I talked about grading, um, we're looking at process skills. So this adds an element of um, grading to the participation. So you're not just giving points for showing up. Um, I look at activity completion and consistency versus accuracy. Did they arrive at an answer? Was the answer complete and was it consistent? If it's the wrong answer, that's something we can work with after the fact. But the, the point that they um, had questions they didn't know the answers to, they worked together to come up with an answer and they completely did that and consistently did that throughout the activity. That is more what I'm looking at. The accuracy portion of it is a lot easier than to correct to say, okay, I understand this is what you did. This has really good justification. You made a really good argument for it. This is actually the answer and here's why. Let's look at the differences. And now we have a teaching moment. Now we have a moment where we can step back and say, that's a really good answer. Here's the right answer, but here's why this one is the right one. Can you tell me what the differences are? And so now they have to start to analyze that information and start to pull out of that information what's actually important that makes that answer more correct than the one they provided. Um, <clears throat> to reinforce some of this learning from a previous POGO activity, sometimes I do mini qu quizzes um, when they first come in. Maybe it's five or six questions. Um, they may be multiple choice, they may be short answer, whatever, or it may be a little activity like label um, a B flat major scale on this blank keyboard, um, something like that. But Whatever it is, um, I have them complete that for the first five minutes of class, just to kind of refresh what they were able to retain from the last class. Um, there are certain questions that I may pull out as key questions that I wanna make sure that are accurate. Um, we just talked about accuracy versus consistency and completion, but there may be a very important questions that I really want them to get right. Um, and I may grade those or tell them, hey, this one's actually gonna be worth points. So put a little bit more time into this one. Um, and then, I usually put um, one or two of these questions from their actual activity on the exam. So their activity, when they leave the class that day, the activity they take with them is literally their study guide. I am not a fan of writing study guides. Um, and I hate, you know, we always have those students that say, well, is there gonna be a study guide? Yeah, it's called your book. Um, <laughs> but instead of sitting down and writing out, okay, these are the terms I want you to know. Can you answer these questions? You know that kind of study guide. This is the discovery of that material. This is the material for which you're being held accountable. This is what I want you to know and learn. So I may literally put an exact question as it appears, copy and pasted from the activity on the test. That gives them the opportunity for some easier points, if you will, but they're able to look through their um, notes and they're able to know that, okay, some of these questions may actually appear on the test. So if I'm comfortable studying this, I should be comfortable on the test. Um, so again, something you may want to do. Um, these are the process roles <clears throat> um, that we are grading on if you're choosing to grade. If you're not choosing to grade um, or give points for these, that's fine. Um, you can do what you want, but um, I still generally give them feedback on these. So for instance, teamwork, how's the team working together? Are they working well together? Um, can there be improvement? Where could the improvement be? What about their information processing? Are they able to take that information and manipulate it to make a better, uh, more thorough answer? Are they able to take that information and get to a different point in the activity uh, with that information? Um, we talked about teamwork problem solving. 
you know, looking at a problem that's given or a question that's posed based on maybe a certain composition or a certain composer, are they able to take information about the romantic period and apply it to that composition and apply it to that, um, that particular composer to make a resolution or a, a solution to that problem or a, an answer that makes sense. And so there's a lot of aspects of this process that go into these activities. So let's talk about the learning activities themselves. I've talked about kind of how to implement them, but let's talk about the activities themselves. Basic guidelines. There are some learning cycle activities and then there are application activities. Learning cycle activities can help to um, take the, the content knowledge that you need them to know, <coughs> excuse me, in the material you, need, you want them to know and help them to discover it through exploring not only their reading, but their prior knowledge and looking at um, different um, examples and music, for example. Um, we can also start to um, look at terms. We know that there, in music, there are a lot of terms that are um, Italian, sometimes Latin, things like that. And so we can use those um, and kind of as an activity and kind of start to look at how these words are used um, to either affect the music, the style of the music, what does the composer mean by this, um, but to kind of have them, you know, uh, some of the questions I have where I will have the um, tempo marking or an expressive marking, I'll have it taken out or blanked out, I'll have them listen to it, and then I'll have some choices for words that could apply to that. And I might ask them, what do you think the composer, based on this performance of this work, how do you think the composer um, labeled this section? Or what tempo do you think the composer assigned to this section? And so that helps them kind of, you know, really relate to these terms, almost as if they were putting them on the music themselves. Um, and there are application activities. And these really help to, again, take that material and take it from the book and actually use it to apply to something else. Usually at the end of an activity, I will have the students kind of solve a problem or take a larger, broader look at what was being discussed or what was being taught and kind of incorporating that back into the material by using all these different parts of the material itself. Um, so for instance, if you're talking about rhythm, meter, um, note duration, things like that, um, at the end, a more application type problem would be to um, either have the students count the rhythm that's there or have them um, write a small rhythmic line on their own to make sure that they understand, you know, there's four beats per measure, no matter what you um, use as far as notes, there have to be a total number of four beats in that measure. So something like that that may actually get them to use their idea of, of how rhythm works, um, how note durations work, things like that, and incorporating it into one little project. Each activity usually starts with a model. So um, usually at the top, I will either have um, maybe a diagram if it's like Maybe you're talking about dynamic ranges. You go from pianissimo to fortissimo, and you have the, um, you know, them going from soft to loud across the top of the page. And so that might be a model to understand dynamic ranges. Or I may just have a small brief introduction as far as text goes to say, you know, uh, in your previous activity, we learned about blank. Now we're going to take some of those concepts and see how they relate to opera or how they relate to the symphony or how they relate to vocal music. So things like that, they kind of show them a little bit of how what we're doing is relevant and kind of giving them a context for what we're doing. Um, in some lessons, this may be the like a bell ringer activity. So you may um, use like a small video or something, whatever. It gives them an idea of what you're going to be talking about. There's usually one to three content learning objectives. So we're gonna be looking at blank, blank, and blank. Um, I don't normally list those on my activities and I, do, I don't because they are listed in the syllabus um, under our learning objectives. And I tell my students at the beginning of the year, you know, this is what you can expect to learn. It's not gonna be flat out in front of you, but by the end of the year, if I have not taught you 
these things, then I have not done my job. So these are what we're going to learn. Um, so I don't reiterate them that often. And then one to two process skills targeted for each development. So that's again, something I usually will tell them verbally. I don't necessarily put it on the uh, chart or excuse me, on the activity because I um, sometimes change those up. So, you know, when we start the activity, I say today I might be looking at teamwork and time management. That way they know what I'm going to be looking for. So they know that, you know, these are the things we need to look at. Um, and the IEA, IEA uh, paradigm here is that through exploration, we are kind of inventing concepts. Now, I don't often give them terms. I give them um, ideas. I give them the definition, essentially, of a term. And then I have them apply that before they actually start to learn the term itself. So that way, before they actually know the word, um, for instance, syncopation, they know what syncopation is, they know how syncopation sounds, and they know what syncopate or how syncopation works. Um, and so that then is applied or used for application purposes later. When we go back and look at a song and I have them pick out an area of the song that um, in which syncopation is used. So a little bit of inductive learning and then some deductive learning using the information that they just learned. The activities themselves always, I have a title for each of them. They have a why, which is that, um, that concept for what, why we're doing this. Again, it could be a video or something like that, or obviously we're in music class, so it could be a composition you have them listen to. Um, if there's any prerequisites that they need. So this doesn't necessarily apply to us um, in the music world. Um, I guess it could. I'm sure I have one or two in, in my activities, but um, essentially thinking from like a, a math or a chemistry standpoint, maybe there's an algorithm I need them to know. Um, then I would list that there. Um, learning objectives, uh, the model. So what they're looking at um, the questions, I usually have five, three to 10. I usually try to get around five or six per model. Um, so showing them that, you know, this is the idea of the romantic period. And so some exploration questions about the romantic period um, to kind of give them a little bit of uh, guidance through that model that I just gave them. Um, and each one increases in difficulty. Usually they will flow so that the first one or I'm sorry, the second one is built on the first one and the third one is built on the second and first. And they flow more through um, exploration than just saying, what is another term for soft? Um, we start to talk about different aspects of dynamics and we start to think about um, the dynamic ranges that we had just heard in the model, um, things like that. And so we start to apply this stuff as we're learning it. There's usually um, one or two exercises to help them apply this. And then again, like I said, a problem. Now, the problem is generally something that they can't just look at at the end of the activity and solve without going through the activity. This is something that they have to um, kind of put together a bunch of ideas. So for instance, if I'm asking, you know, maybe the lesson was on dynamic dynamics and, um, the problem may be something to the effect of what are, you know, what are certain things that can increase dynamic ranges aside from, um, aside from dynamic markings in the music. So this takes from them some knowledge that they learned whenever they learned about the instruments and knowing that airspeed um, can, control dynamic ranges for an instrumentalist or when they play the harpsichord that you know pressing the piano or I'm sorry, pressing the key down um, harder can affect dynamic ranges or when they play on a um, membranophone that you know striking the drum harder is something that can create a larger a louder dynamic level so again this takes on more than just what was learned in that activity and applies a lot of it together just to give you some uh, background here, just versus the traditional classroom, your job again is to help students learn. Their, the source of the material is through this learning cycle activities, through these group 
interactions, which their role is a group participant. They're to discover things rather than just kind of memorize notes. And the emphasis is on cooperation and teaching each other. Um, I'm trying to keep this under a half an hour so that you guys um, don't get too bored. Um, I'd definitely be happy to discuss this more with you one-on-one um, -on -one if you would like, or we can do another lecture at some point on this to kind of look at these activities and how to apply them. Um, but I will give you these resources now. First of all is pogo.org. Um, I don't think they have any music stuff on there specifically, but there are activities for other um, for other subject matters that you can look at and, and tailor them to your um, specialty. Um, as well, all the guides on how to write Pogo questions, how to structure your classroom, how to divide people into groups, all those questions are answered on there. There's manuals on there. They're all free. Um, there's also some workshops on there that you can attend, and I'm sure there are some now due to COVID that are online. My email address is there as always if you have any questions. Um, and that Dropbox link, which is also the flow code on the left, um, will take you to some uh, resources that I've provided. Some of them are from the Pogel, from Pogel.org. Some are my own personal and how I've applied them to the music classroom. Um, again, I structure my entire class like this. So the first day of class at Penn Highlands for me is syllabus day. We go over all that. We take a quiz, essentially a quiz, um, where I get to learn about the students, like what their favorite types of music are. I ask them some weird questions just to kind of get their brains turning a little bit. After that, we hit the ground running with Pogel. Day two through the end, every day is a different activity. I walk in the room, I tell them the concept for the day, you know, what pages we're, we're looking at in the book, um, which they should have known from the last class because they were to have read them the night before. Um, but oh, we talk about that. And then within the first five or 10 minutes, we are already into the activity. And my role then is to walk around the room, go to each group, looking at the process skills that are being used, you know, making some notes about how they're working as a group, um, but at the same time, answering any questions they may have, not necessarily about the material, um, but if they're kind of lost or stuck, I may clarify something here or there to help them, again, discover on their own rather than just providing an answer. My role is to facilitate, which means I am not lecturing. Um, and so that's kind of a different viewpoint of the teacher and one that I've become super familiar with and super excited about. And I hope that if you have any questions, you feel free to reach out. And thanks for listening.